Good afternoon. Sorry, some, some heavy trucks with Jed Parker. I couldn't even hear. How are we all doing today? Good afternoon. Good, thanks. How are you? Hi, good evening, all. How are you all doing today? Good evening, doing well. That's good. Happy, happy new year to all and welcome. Um, I see only three of us are here, so I'm wondering if we should give everybody an extra five minutes um, before we start. Is that okay? Ashley and Gerard, is that good? We, you'll start at 6.05? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay, so we'll give them a few minutes. Okay. okay. So you oh, okay, okay, okay. Now I understand what happened. Hi guys, welcome. We're, we're just giving everybody a few minutes, so we'll start at 6.05, okay?
Okay, guys, I, I saw one or two persons join, but I guess they dropped off. Um, but it's being recorded nevertheless. So I guess we will, without further ado, we will start. So once again, Happy New Year and welcome back. I trust that you all had an enjoyable holiday and so far your New Year is prosperous. Um, I'm wondering if we all had a chance to catch up. Um, I wanted to look back at the chapter eight and also talk about you know, homework, but I don't know if the people that need to hear about homework and points and everything is, is at classes yet. So perhaps um, we are going to have that discussion. So um, in terms of classwork and your 5%, um, how, how are things going with persons that do not have their 5% as yet? The deadline is January 24th. Is there anybody here now that does not have their 5%? Hi, good afternoon, Ms. Bullard. Oh. Hi, good afternoon, Dorado. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Happy New Year, by the way. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Same to you. Yeah, so anybody who does not have their, I need to pull up my grade sheet. One second, let me pull that up. Anybody who does not have their 5%, are we on track for that? January 24 date or we need that five percent. No, I I definitely need a five percent. I, <laughs> I I look forward to I look forward to next week. Um this this week was a conflict of interest for me. Um being that I work shift and I wasn't I wasn't able to you know attend um any of the Toastmasters meeting. I had um an invite but like I said because of um scheduling um that created an issue whereby um next week I foresee myself um being in attendance for the Toastmasters 1600 club all right so I'll be able to provide information God's willing next week okay okay very good very good okay so again like I say the five percent um saves a lot of lives saves you two hundred dollars from taking a retake um it's the difference between uh a 85 and a 90 which is an a and then for some persons who just made it to 65 that 5% helps you. So please, please don't take it for granted. And like I said, there are just one or two persons that have not done or submitted homework. Again, I've not seen anybody pass this class without submitting homework. And in fact, about two or three classes ago, I had a person who is normally an A student and he normally does very well. However, Something happened during the, those 10 weeks and he did not submit his homework. Well, he did do very well on the final exam. However, his company only pays for A's and B's. They don't pay for C's. And he, because he did not do his homework, he only got a C. And so therefore he had to pay the full amount, you know? And now he's saying, can I retake the exam? Can I pay the 200? At least that'll save me some um, five, six hundred dollars because they'll pay the difference. But I said, even if you pay the two hundred dollars, you you got a pretty uh, good exam grade. But it's only uh, what is it, seventy percent of your grade. So there was no way for him to even get up to. He would have to get a hundred something on that exam for him to, you know. So please, like I say, please do your homework. Please don't take it for granted. It is for practice, it's 20% of your grade. And I promise you this, this homework question is on the final exam. So, you know, please take some time and, and do your homework, okay? And then again, we're looking at the screen, we see that to get that 5% is no later than January 24th. So we still have some time left. And I know it's the beginning of the year, it's pretty hectic. Tomorrow's a holiday and um, everybody is, I guess, in holiday mode, but hopefully we, we, we get through this um, as quickly as possible. And remember January 31st, I know it's the end of the month. The end of the month is pretty busy in, in most organizations. So please, I would have hoped that you put in your study leave, you would have organized some time off if your company offers it, or even a you know responsibility leave day or a um, vacation day if needed, okay? And then again, um, for persons who 
um, I think one or two of you took this class so that you can go into ICA. I think ICA is starting next week. Um, classes are filling out. So please contact the office and speak to Ms. Dean in terms of getting into the ICA class. Okay, um, Gerardo, go ahead. Ms. Bullard, just, just for clarity. <clears throat> You, you're breaking up, Gerardo. I can't hear you. The um, the homework assignment that you spoke about. That, I apologize. Let me try to get a better um, a better signal. Can you hear me, Ms. Bullet? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, the question I was asking you is... Okay, you broke up again. <laughs> I got to hear you, those, but then you broke up those, again. Those, those questions. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. The... No, I can't hear you again. Assignment. Um, based on based on the different sections. Oh boy. Now. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. The homework. The homework assignment. Um, based on the the uh the ten the ten units. Um, those are just for us to personally um complete, right? That's separate and apart from from the essay that we had to submit. Right, right. So there's classwork and then there's right. homework. So this is the, the homework that you submitted already because I, I think I have a grade for you. So this is the homework yes, that's worth 20%. And then yes. uh -huh. the other handout, this is the classwork that you just do for practice to understand. make sure that at the end of the class that you understand how to answer those questions. Yes, ma'am. I understand this. Ms. Okay. Okay, good. Thank and you. and Chapter nine is pretty short and sweet, but surprisingly, a lot of persons do not know how to write, you know, chapter nine in an essay form in order for you to get full points, okay? So before we go into chapter nine, we just wanna um, read, and I'm gonna tell you a story. And most of you who took my class already, you already know this story, right? Um, it says your receptionist calls, the regulator, the director of the FIU, and the commissioner of police is in the lobby of your firm, requesting to see the MLRO. They have a warrant, and they want to carry out an inspection based on an SDIU file regarding a theft count. So A asks, what are your next steps? Then B, how do you balance cooperation with law enforcement and maintain client confidentiality? And then C asks, a staff member of your firm is implicated in an investigation and they also have a warrant for his arrest. What are your next steps? Okay, so we wanna ensure by the end of this class that we can answer all of those questions. Again, with this homework question, question four, for the one or two of you that have not sent in homework, this question is similar. And I think we talked about this last week or the last time we had class, whereas most persons focus on STRs and they, they write a whole essay on STRs when in actuality the question asks about failing to disclose and then confidentiality. Okay, so make sure that you can understand, um, answer question four as well as the class work by the end of this class. Okay, now we are on chapter nine. We have one more chapter, chapter 10. So next week, um, in preparation for our review class, that's gonna be held on, let's see, when it's a review class on the 23rd, I am going to send out um, a list of, I guess, topics that we expect to see on the final exam. And I'm gonna assign each person to um, answer one of those questions. Some of you may have to answer too, okay? But I will send out the review sheet next week. So please look out for that. And if you don't get that um, by next week, Monday's class, just let me know um, that you didn't receive it in, in, in the email, okay? So um, review class for the 23rd, okay? Is that clear? Yes. Are we there? Yes, there. yes. Okay, okay, yes, good. good, very good. Okay, so uh, did we have the chance to read the newspaper or are we still in happy new year mode? Uh, are we keeping abreast of what's going on over the holidays? I started to read something right before class about ROAC X, um, trying to pursue international bonds. Um, 
throughout the Caribbean community through CARICOM and trying to assist um, businesses in Haiti that are members of CARICOM as well. Okay, well, okay interesting because I, I I I imagine they do they do need some assistance, but I know years ago um we had a client um out of Haiti and she actually had like twenty million dollars and we used to do a lot of transfers for her. So um yeah, I, I, I imagine a lot of things changed after the I guess the tornado, but there are a few millionaires living um, they are in Haiti and she's an artist. And so in, in terms of, you know, selling her paintings and, and collecting money on her behalf, um, we did a lot of transfers for her. So we are not, it'll be a good thing. Cause like I say, a very, I guess, select few, of course, you know, 90% of the country is below the poverty line, but yeah, there's a select few that have a lot of money. So I'm not su surprised. Okay, so anybody paying attention to Arawak X? Do we all understand what Arawak X is? And we've been, um, of course, following the FinTech Hub at the Securities Commission. Outside of FTX, we do understand what Arawak X is. Ashley? Yes, I heard about it, um, I guess, like a few years back. Okay. And they kind of basically do. Um, as far as I know, I believe more like um, selling of shares or IPOs for different Bahamian companies. And people that want to invest in those Bahamian companies, they sell shares through Arawak X. Am I correct? I believe that's what I. Co correct. And, and basically, it's crowdfunding, is the correct right. terminology. Correct. And it's like GoFundMe, the American GoFundMe, because a lot of Bahamians you see on GoFundMe. However, our GoFundMe is for Americans and Canadians because, of course, Uncle Sam has to get his piece of the pie. And so, our WACAX is a like a crowdfunding organization. Um, I think most gas. I don't know if you are familiar. They've been around for years, and um, they are presently selling shares um, into that gas company, trying to raise funds. And so, um, our WACAX will facilitate the collection of those funds and issuing the shares, like Ashley said. Um, Kendrick, you wanted to say something? No? Okay, yeah, so again. Uh, no, 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 I was just agreeing with you. It's a crowdfunding platform whereby mm -hmm. people can go and invest their resources. And uh, for a few that I have seen recently, they have been getting a significant amount of public investment in those particular platforms. They have sold out and exceeded the target mark that they've had as well. But a few times that I went on, because uh, I was interested in one or two of them, and I noticed that, especially the food-based ones, and they sold out quick, they hit their targets, and they exceeded what they wanted. Okay, very, very, very good. And I was supposed to do a follow-up because apparently um, Red Lobster was coming in, this new plaza that they're opening on, Prince Charles Drive, and they had set it up to our WACX um, to sell the shares, and they were not successful. And so I was interested in seeing the process in terms of the people who had already um, contributed the return of their funds. And I just wanted to find out, was it a seamless process? Was it as easy as how you made the deposit or sent in the wire? Did they wire your money back? And so I, I was supposed to follow up. Um, anybody aware of that? Um, Kendrick, you know of that one about the Red Lobster? Okay, I didn't. I thought they had exceeded their their target with no, Red. Lobster. They didn't meet it, and they canceled it. They didn't meet the target. It wasn't. They didn't have enough subscribers. Uh -huh. and it was canceled. That was the last word I got. And so I said, I'm very interested because this is a new platform. And of course, it's regulated under the Securities Commission. I, I, I'm not trying to enforce under the DEA, or it has a separate law, but more than likely, I think it's under the DEA. But I wanted to, you know, I just wanted to know out of curiosity, were, were the people that subscribed, were they successfully returned their funds? 
Uh, I haven't heard anything, uh, but if you... Uh, yeah, I'll I... do some research, yeah. Ms. Ms. Puller, if I could pull this up real quick. Yeah, pull it up. This is what that. Oh, you guys can see that? Mm -hmm. it, yes, it, it, yes. Like with this particular one here, when I was looking at this. Right, tropical that, yeah. And the gas. Now, I saw, like you were talking about, Ms. Bullet. Mm -hmm. Already exceeding. I mean, it's it's something interesting that I looked at. Because, uh, again, I was a little bit, I see that uh, someone put it in the group that IPOs at CV were being offered again. Yes. Yeah. So there's opportunities out there, even for if you get a small amount this time around, there's opportunities out there. Right. And, and Kendrick, put, pull it back up for me, please. And, right. and, and just see if you can pull up um, um, Red Lobster and see if, if anything, if, if it says anything about it. But, you know, if you just want to give it a try, the minimum subscription, like it's $36. And $50, 50 and so you know, try it, try it with a hundred dollars or try it with five hundred dollars. I mean, whatever. If if you're, you know, it's new and you want to just try it out, just just to get your feet wet to find out the pros and cons and the charges. Um, I I, I think it's a good thing. Um okay. yeah, see see if anything comes up with red lobster. I see that they got some, some stuff here, but liquor, public transportation on the family islands, entertainment, that's a dud. Anything? I was interested in the tropical jar one. I think they're trying yeah, to- Yeah, I want to look good like, because I know that's a big, that's a big seller. If you yeah. look up on Madera Street, you see this, you see the growth of that institution. Yeah, you see there a lot. They're really yeah. good. But what you should do also is go in and see what type of service they offer. If it's a good service and, and they seem to be managed well and the quality of the food and, and, and you could really tell. Because um, my friend, and I'm sorry to say this, had a soft opening for a restaurant that he had refurbished it had a bad reputation and so the thing about it is when he was inviting us you know we kept saying hey that place is a creepy place we would never go there and he said oh no i revamped it whatever so it, just to get us out there he had to send a whole video you know at his soft opening so here it is um we say okay of course we'll come okay that looks different and and you totally turned it around so we went there uh, it doesn't seem as he that he has a professional bartender and his drinks were six, 60 and 50 plus back. And so I don't know if, you know, Ms. Bullet just cheap, right? But if you charge an Atlantis and Bahama price for a drink, it better taste like Atlantis or Bahama drinks. <laughs> you know, like I was, so I just, I, like I feel- Like you mixologist. Yes, <laughs> you have to hire yourself. No, for real, because the thing about it is, like, me in my group, we, we are foodies, so we like to go and do, like, reviews on restaurants or, or, or what have you, and I just had to avoid this call the whole week because there's no way. Okay, here, here it is. Go, go. Okay, they they look like they... they, they I, I know. I know they had said that they were in, they had met there their amount. I thought they said they did. It's okay. It says project was successful. Yeah. So what, what was, okay. So good. see why it's good to do research. I, I, I have a question. I think, I, is it Mr. What's his name now? Mortimer, I think his name is. Yeah. Is yeah. He's doing this. He, he is the, um, he did the red, not the red love. So what was it? The Outback Steakhouse and, mm -hmm. and then the movie. So he's a pretty good investor, but he has, I mean, Galleria did close out after IMAX. Now, I don't think he, he is affiliated with IMAX. I think the Chinese own I, IMAX and they have some payments running for them. I could be wrong, but hey, guess what I was wrong about this. Yeah, oh. but they, they raised the money. So 
I wonder why they were saying that it wasn't why I had the wrong news. I was I passed through the plaza on last week, right? Because I know they were I figured they were trying to open Subway and Starbucks before December, before the the, the hopping time in December before Christmas. I said to my wife, I said, listen, I don't even see someplace even remotely organized enough or big enough to house a red lobster. So could it be that the license, the licensee uh, said, I don't want my business in this particular area because you know how finicky these people go with their brand. Yeah, the franchise, you mean, yeah. yeah. So perhaps they had some franchise problems. Scroll down, let's see if they have anything on it. Because they were saying that this literally just closed this week eight. It's a, it, we plan to open two restaurants in East Indian New Providence. Bullet. Okay. Yes. You know, you know what is so funny about that this new proposed um on this IHOP place, the same developer, it seems like there, there's there's like no longevity. Everything that this mom puts us on and you know it may be around for maybe what one to two years and then you know eventually it closes. He, he, he's not consistent. Including the DNA, including the DNA. So everything that this mom, I'm I'm right. wondering how this is a spiritual thing because it seems to me like everything this brother touches collapses. Okay, and again, this is what I'm saying. You now have the opportunity to go in and see if they offer good service and if they have good food, because that's what the, you know, and, and who is managing. So yeah, you have that hands on, but do your research before you, you invest. But this, like I say, this seems to be, you know, Red Lobster is already a strong brand. Will he be able to manage it properly? We, we don't know. We, we just don't know. And perhaps that's why Gerardo, this that, that's why he probably haven't. It's probably from the franchise and um, that he had the issue. I thought it was from the subscription end. No, they beat that. They exceed that. Okay, yeah. so I I gotta dig deeper because I I show Miss Bullet and just make this stuff up up in her head. <laughs> so I had to hear that somewhere. Okay, so very good guys. And like I say, just, you know, just to get your feet wet, um, you know, make the small $100, $200 investment and just see what, what are the, how, what are the challenges? Because I know with CFAL, you know, I had invested with CFAL for a while and then I had an issue with the manage, how they are managing stuff. And then they charge you 50% of whatever you make. And so, I, I wasn't into that any longer. So you look at those types of things. But anyway, back to my friend who I've been avoiding all week. Yeah, he ain't gonna make it. He, I, I sorry to give the doom and gloom report, but you have to have a mixologist if you're charging 16, 50 plus back for drinks. And yeah, and at, at that location that already have a bad reputation that you kind of, you know, change, but and the food be better be off the chain because people already saying, wait, look, you, you charging top tier price. So it ain't gonna be long before, you know, Bahamians like new stuff. I give him, I don't yeah. even think he can make it in the February. That's how distraught I was over those prices. But Miss Bullet might be cheap. I don't know, y'all young people might, that, that might be normal. You're, you're spending like $18 for drinks outside of Bahama and Atlantis. See, Miss Bullet, I don't drink, so that eliminates me from that. <laughs> that okay? I'll put the drinkers in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see, Eddie. See, Eddie, the boss. what? Eddie, I you spending go. um eighteen dollars for one drink, and it's a bad. It, it was so bad you couldn't even drink it. Or oh, Eddie say he ain't drinking. What? What would you ask me? No, that has to be. That drink has to be right. That has to be right, right? Okay, but yeah, I'll be going back to our normal place. Exactly. <laughs> Where we know they have a mixologist and the drinks could be good and we don't mind paying the back plus props, but Ms. he ain't gonna make it. He ain't gonna make it. I'm sorry to say. Ms. Yeah, Ms. so do do your homework before you invest. I'm um, sorry, Dorado, go ahead. Hey, I ain't know but the rest of my cohorts, but I only take in communion. I, I straight. Okay, okay, well that's good. You all say okay, what but food punch? Food punch. Suppose he charging like twelve dollars for a food punch. Sure. Blue boy in the store. 
No, but I mean, if you go to Atlanta, you expect to pay, you know, the high end price for food punch. What, what is it now? What, $8.50 or $9? What is it? $7. Uh, no, it's $8 at Traveler's Rest. Okay, $8 know. at Traveler's So Atlanta, you would expect to pay $8 or $9. But was it good? It was, it was. Okay, so you, you don't mind spending your money when it's good, but when you could barely drink the drink, and the thing about it, the, the bartender made like three drinks and everybody had to like say, could you put some more lemon? Could you add this? Could you do this? And then he offers, he said, oh, I, I might have just made a little mistake. Let me make your drink over. I say, sweetie, just, just leave it. You know, I'll just have a baltonic or something. Don't, don't try it again. But you no, know, you have to have a professional. Yeah. Okay. Very, very good that um, we were able to keep up and, and get some good information. Kendrick, um, thank you for sharing, but look, look into it. Remember, Ms. Bullitt always says you need those five revenue streams. And um, if you don't take some risks, you know, um, you don't make any money. So we don't want to take that FTX risk, but we want to do research and make sure we look at the management, we, we look at the product and we look at the service. And, and then you make a uh, educated guess whether this company will will make it or not and and definitely the history of the owner and that's that's why beneficial owner is very important we know this more and more guy and we know he has been successful but he he, he only lasts for two or three years so unless you invest right away and pull out i mean but you don't really make any money until unless you leave that like five six years anyway so i don't know okay so so very good, very good. So any questions or concerns or we are good, we are all still on track? We good? Y'all gotta come talk back to me, talk back Ms. to Ms. me. Ms. Yes, Vince, I, I, I uh, had to uh, go revise today. So I had to reach out to Eddie to see if I could find out some information. But it's all about getting back and revising and going over the uh, eight, Eight chap previous chapters, getting back into those and being able to answer the question at the back of on on the notes for, for classwork. Okay. okay. Ms. Okay. Bullard. Yes. You did say that we're going to have a, a, a review for this um for this chapter nine because um I'm actually <clears throat> I'm stuck I'm stuck on A and 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 B. I've read chapter nine. But in terms of you know um, being prepared to in the event that this is this, this appears on the exam, I'm still somewhat having issues with with answering these questions. Okay, okay. So let me know. We'll go through it, and mm -hmm. and, and then let me know um, how you feel at the end. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, okay, good. So um, I've always said, or and I think in a few classes before we did the suspicious transaction chapter eight. I, I said to go into your institutions and I know it's difficult for some of you because um, perhaps you don't work in a bank or um, you don't have, you know, suspicious activity. But, I, you know, what I wanted you to do was go into your institution and find out exactly what you do or how it is managed in terms of suspicious transactions or suspicious activity. So we are backtracking back to um, chapter eight on a very important question, which a lot of persons get confused over. How are suspicious transactions established? Okay, so all, always remember, this is how a suspicious transaction is established or how suspicious activity is established. When you go into your institution at onboarding, at account opening, Remember the statutory requirement of identification. We will identify you based on the identification you provide, your place of employment, how much money you make, or if you're a company, um, the type of your business area, the country you do business with, and the type of business you do. So at the beginning of the relationship with an institution, you establish a profile. Okay, and for administrative purposes, um, there are thresholds that we put in place. And so we ask you for a job letter. And if you say you make $2,000 a month, we will probably let you deposit up to three 
$3,500 a month. But if you go to four and $5,000, we will call you in and ask you to declare the source of funds because we would have only verified you for that $2,000. We would have only verified you for the frequency that you said you would make those deposits. So if you come into the bank and say, I'm a government employee, but I'm going to deposit every week, what we are supposed to do is corroborate the information you give us and ask you, Kendrick, you're a government employee. You all get paid once a month. Where will you get money from every week to deposit to this bank? Sell me. <laughs> okay, so there you go. Kendrick will then explain, I have five revenue streams. I told ASU, they pay the ASU every week and I get $50. So I'll be depositing that $50 from the ASU you, you know, as the ACU holder, or I have a car wash. And so persons make deposits every day. I mean, they get their car wash every day and I'll make a deposit each week, right? And so we'll say, okay, bring in your business license from your car wash. Give us some type of um, um, indication of how many cars you wash and how much money you make, okay? And so we will corroborate that and we will put all of this down as your profile, okay? If you, like I say, there are um, thresholds. And so we allow you to go 20% above that threshold. But if you go over that 20%, like I say, we call you in and we ask you to declare the source of funds, okay? And remember, we talked about Brent Simonet. One year, Brent Simonet had $50 million. The next year, <clears throat> he had $150 million, right? And so when that $100 million came into the bank as a transfer, of course, we would have blocked that account. We called Brent Simonet in and we said, sir, can you please tell us where you got $100 million from? One year ago, we checked your finances and your companies and we saw that your revenue was $50 million and we documented that. Where did the $100 million come from? And so he said, my mother passed away. Here's the debt certificate. Here's the source of funds, proof of source of funds. Okay. And so therefore, okay, fine. We can confirm that his mother indeed passed away. And the will did say $100 million was left. And this is where the money came from. Okay. However, we do have other cases where persons never come in or they, they can't tell us where the money has come from and they, they can't um, say how they came about the money or they actually admit to you, like my car wash guy, Miss Bullet, I do a little deal on the side. And I'm only telling you that Miss Bullet gives me a deal cool. okay? So when you hear all these deals on the side, then of course you accept the money, you put that money on hold and then you get to the SDR form, the suspicious transaction form, okay? So it, and suspicious transaction is established anytime somebody goes out of their profile, okay? So for us that work in banks, there has to be a system in place to help you identify when somebody goes out, outside of their profile, okay? Because if you have, 800 accounts, you can't be looking at 800 accounts manually, okay? Just administratively, it is feasible, okay? So if you work to one of those Fortune 500 banks, they have systems like World Check that check transactions, and they also check names. So every night, the system scans Bria Watson, and if Bria Watson is arrested, the system will print out a report the next you know, the next day, because most of this is done post and say Bria, Bria got arrested last night, okay? And then you would go investigate as to why Bria got uh, arrested. So I had a client and again, our system through World Check gave me a hit on my client's name and it said that he had been arrested for money laundering in Malaysia. So I had to again, put all his funds on the hold and then do an investigation. At the same time, you can not tip the customer off, okay? You cannot tip the customer off and you also cannot fail to disclose. 
Okay, so under the Proceeds of Crime Act, there um, there are two charges for tipping off and and failing to disclose. So we have three DODIs working in the financial services sector. You're obligated. You cannot fail to disclose. You cannot tip the customer off, but you also have a duty of confidentiality. And this is where we move into chapter. Okay. With that duty of confidentiality to your customer, you must cooperate with law enforcement. Okay? So we know how this suspicious transaction has been established. This person has gone outside of their transactional activity that we verified them for, and they cannot produce us evidence of source of funds. They cannot say, somebody died, I got a bonus, or I sold a piece of property. They, they cannot bring us any evidence. or our system would have gave us a hit and said that there's negative media out there. You are running for the government of Malaysia. So that was the first indication. We never even knew he was a pet. When he started to run for um, government, when he opened the account, he was just uh, uh, somebody uh, work, you know, working in an office. And now he had registered, and that's what happened with a lot of uh, MPs with the DNAs and the COIs and the ones that are not repeat MPs, or, you know, some of them are one-hit wonders. So you have to keep abreast of, you know, who is running. And so when the election, um, what is it, polls come out and then say, oh, these are the candidates, we need to look at all of the candidates, not just the BLB and the uh, FNM, we have the DNA, the CUI, and there was three or four other little groups, okay? All of those persons, we now need to update and change them to PEP stops, okay? And, and increase their monitoring, okay? So duty of confidentiality, but we must cooperate. So how does that happen? And this is what question nine says. Now, I had a coworker, and my coworker again was arrested at work. In his previous job, he had been fired for insider trading. However, I don't know how he passed all the screenings, but he passed the screenings and he was hired at the Royal Bank of Canada. And so he came in um, to work every day for about five years. And one day the police showed up um, to Royal Bank and they said that we have a warrant for his arrest. And they did question us. Did you all not know that he was charged with insider trading? So again, what is very important is that you look at what your AML directive says. You have to find out if it's for customers and for staff members, if it's if they are accused or if they are charged. Okay, because all of that must be documented in your AML directive. And whatever that directive says is what the court is going to go by and what audit is going to go by. So you want to make sure that that is documented properly. Okay, and so they came in and they said, um, we have this warrant for his arrest. What do you do? You know, a lot of persons like to say, well, oh, I'm the compliance officer. I can handle this, this is my job. I, in particular, if you're gonna have to give testimony um, later, it's best that you have a witness there. And if you have internal legal, I would, you know, invite the persons in, or I invited the persons in, I put them in a, uh, an office and, uh, you know, try to be as confidential as possible. So they said, we have the warrant for this arrest. I said, okay, I'm going to call legal. So I got legal on the, the phone. I, I spoke to the CEO and I said, okay, um, what is the charge? I said, 
you know, this is a charge. He was charged before. We don't know how you all hired him, but um, we're here to arrest him. We said, okay. And we said, maybe have a moment with him. Can we bring him out again? We want to be as private as possible. We do not want a scene. And, and they said, okay, that's fine. We have five minutes. But again, if he runs, then you know you're, you're going to be responsible. And I said, okay, fine. I don't think he's going to run. And so we went out. We called him into another office again, trying to be discreet and as confidential as possible. And we said, um, the police is out there and they have a warrant for your arrest. And um, they say they came to take you. And so he said, okay, um, what, what should I do? I said, okay, you have to go with the police, but our legal team is um, on the line as well as um, the CEO is going to join us. Um, and we're going to give you the opportunity to resign. And he just said, okay, I, I'll take a pen and a paper. And he wrote a resignation letter and he resigned. And so we took him out to the police, trying to be, again, like I said, this group as possible, handed him over to the police. We asked the police to be not to handcuff him until he went outside and tried to be discreet as possible. And they said, okay. So the police is now leaving with him. They did not handcuff him inside the bank. But the minute the door closed, they put the handcuff on him. They say, lock, you lock up, you lock up. They walk him down the stairs. They turn on the siren. Everybody run to the door, to the windows and was glued. And he was like, please take your seats. Please get back to work. And they made a big dramatization. They drove around the parking lot twice, wheeling the woo 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 woo. So everybody was looking and, you know, so again, we did all of that because we wanted to avoid reputational risk. But um, he went to court and I guess that court case went on for another five years. And then he was acquitted because at the time that he committed the crime, insider trading was not a law on our books, okay? Not that he did not commit the crime, but he ended up winning that case, okay? So later on, um, he then got a job at the Ministry of Finance. And I, I wanted to share um, this with you because our topic for this semester is corruption. And so I wanted to share with you I don't know if you can see this. I don't know if you can see. The prosecution can... today dropping its corruption case against Hiram Cox, a senior official of the department. Can we can we see your hair that or no? Yes, I can. You can see on here? OK, okay good. That's positive. The case before Magistrate Shaka Surville was withdrawn when Cox appeared. The corruption by a public officer charge stems from claims that in 2020, Cox solicited a $10,000 bribe from Preston Roll. According to Roll's testimony, his company, Amani Hair, had been cited for tax evasion. Roll testifying he secretly recorded Cox asking for the bribe during a meeting they had on August 25, 2020. In the recording, a man identified by Roll as Cox said, quote, I'm proposing that I could reduce the fixed penalties immediately. I could take off $100,000 immediately but that will cost you 10 grand, end quote. In March 2022, the court ruled Cox had a case to answer. Since the complaint was withdrawn after Cox was called upon to present a defense, he was acquitted. Okay, so again, acquitted a second time. Ms. Ms. Right? Bullock, what's his first name? Hiram. Wow. Right. So again, I just, this, this is that, that was the second time. And like I said, I guess he won not because he wasn't guilty, but because it was not a crime at the time. Ms. Bullen, okay, so yes. Do we do we have any do we have any uh, practice attorneys in this in this um, session right now? Any? I don't. I I Sharenda, are you a practice attorney? Eddie, no. maybe okay. Eddie can answer. Eddie. The question, the question I pose is that um, there was a, 
you know, a wiretap or some type of secret recording that that got him, you know, caught up in this. I wanted to find out, um, you know, if that were permissible and if that 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 um evidence was was tendered, you know, into or was that you know recording tendered as as evidence? How how was that? Um, how how was that permissible? Seeing that you know he he did that without without not knowing you know that he were being uh, uh you know um secretly recorded at the time. Is there any statute law that speaks to that? I'm 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 not certain. I I'm not certain that I, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I I can't I can't tell you. I can't tell you. We would we okay, have to Paula. probably ask the lawyer. I'll look it up. Yeah yeah. Okay oh. so. Second go round, second um, acquittal. But let's just look at the Securities Commission. Of course, I, we always say that the central bank offers you moral suasion. So if you get into a problem, the central bank tries to avoid the reputational risk. And so what they do is they call you in, they invite you for tea and donuts, they sit you down and they say, we want you to resign or leave the country. In the case of Molina, we talked about a few weeks ago where they had asked him, leave the country, right? However, he said, he's not gonna leave and you can't make him um, sell his shares. And so then they went to the Supreme Court. However, the Securities Commission is a little bit different. Um, the Securities um, Commission, they sent out warnings and notices. So. From he was first let go, of course, they sent out a notice that says, you know, um, he is to not do any business in the securities business. And, you know, they sent a lot of these warnings and, and, and you know, the proceedings against him. However, I think he went back um, and had a hearing where he asked him to apologize, you know, for the reputational risk. Um, against him, I don't know if he was paid, you know, anything, but you can see from this, it says his complaint, his formal complaint is, is hereby discontinued. Now, again, in terms of the law, I can't tell you how they came to the decision. I can't tell you because he was acquitted, then they had no right to, you know, bond him from the Securities Commission for like 10 years, like how they did. Um, What's the other guy? Who was the Chamber of Commerce guy? Who they banned for 10 years? Anybody remember? Edison Sumner. However, you know, he went back and tried to clear his name because again, when um, they onboard staff anywhere, um, there's a background check. And I don't know if they're using World Check or what, um, you know, they ask you to get a police record. I don't know what other, you know, system that they are using to check your name, but I would imagine this would come up, you know, in, you know, his background check. So he would have to explain exactly what happened and he would produce this document where, you know, the Securities Commission no longer had that complaint against him. Okay, so, so, so just so you would know, um, it's not only against companies, it could sometimes be against individuals. But again, my good coworker, Mr. Cox is acquitted, okay? And so that's what the question asks you, what would you do? And a lot of us have um, work relationships, right? A lot of us think it's okay to share passwords. A lot of us think that um, leaving your screen open and the clear desk policy um, is just a waste of time and we don't have time for that. We have files laying about. We walk out the office, we leave files under our desk. We don't lock them away. But remember the Securities Commission, again, was defrauded $850,000 because you know, we just hand our keys over to the car wash guy with name Yaddy, right? We, let, we leave those files in there. We leave our computer bag in there. We don't shred the stuff. We just drop it in the garbage, okay? So people uh, can infiltrate you if you give them access. And the cleaners, they come at night and they take what they want to take. Or somebody could pay them, listen, I need this file, 
okay? You would be very surprised um, um, the extremes people will go dumpster diving um, um, to, to get information, okay? So um, only your enemies you are aware of, but it's your friends. That's what I tried to say in terms of leaving your, sharing your password, or go right down to my desk and you can change the money or go in my till and you can change the money. It, it was always through my entire career, my teller of the year, my closest friend um, who robbed a, a blind man of $80,000. And, and then the teller of the year, Miss Bullard, she's still the teller of the year. She, um, everybody who couldn't speak English, she, she robbed them of more than $100,000. Um, there, I have all sorts of stories. Um, NIB brought back in their checkbook, and they have that automatic sign check checkbook for checks under five thousand. Their PO box was wrong, and so the messenger say, "Oh, um, y'all have to take this checkbook back because the PO box is wrong." So of course, I give those checkbooks to the person who's order checks. What did that person do? took those checks home and take them to the Chinese. They was already signed and they cash them all over the place. $8,000 worth of those checks. Okay, so you have to, you have to um, be very, very, very careful. Okay, with clear desk policy, sharing of information. You have to know exactly what type of systems you have and how they work. Um, if we watched Dirty Money, we saw that Volkswagen defrauded the world with their, it, its emissions test because nobody knew how to use the system, okay? And in my last class, I had somebody who said, oh, Ms. Bully, we have the same problem. We have this new system. We just have to keep calling this one person to enter a code and help us. It, it, that's a risk, okay? So ask for training from the developer, um, find out you know, what systems are autom automated or are names being searched each night, uh, thresholds in the systems, what are the th thresholds? How do we determine, is there a report that's gonna tell us that Ms. Bullet went over our threshold last night? Is there a report that's gonna tell us that Ms. Bullet got arrested? Okay, who receives this report? How does it work? Okay, who is checking it each day? And so these are the questions that you need to ask in order to protect yourself. And like I say, over the course of my career, it has always been, like I said, the tell of the year, my closest friend, uh, somebody who you never thought would do it, who defrauded the bank or who, who was stealing, okay? And so when these people come in, like I said, make sure that you have a witness, you have legal, you have the CEO there, um, first of all, you ask for the warrant and, and you send it on to your legal team to make sure it's legit and you must cooperate. And so you ask them, do we have, how much time do we have to uh, provide this information um, that you want? And, and whatever they say, then you must cooperate. Now, once you file an SDR, you normally get a production order that production order will probably come in a week after you file that SDR. And that production order would state that I want KYC, all the passports for everybody in the class, their proof of address, all their registrations, and whatever you know they ask for. However, when you work in a financial institution, you normally have one big bulky pack. And we tend to be like, oh, they want so much information. We don't have time to copy that. Just give them the whole file, okay? You cannot do that. That's where the duty of confidentiality comes in. And so if there is a specific, I want the wire of $17,000 on January the 5th, you are to copy that from the full statement and only send that. You can't just say, I highlight it and let them see all the rest of the information on the statement. Okay, that is where you are in breach of the confidentiality of your company and your customer. Okay, even when audit comes in or inspectors, whatever they ask for is what you give them. When they send a production order, 
from the courts, only what you give them. Because again, you can assist people winning on a technicality because they are going to say, show me the subpoena or show me the production order where you had the authority to get that from the bank. And if you don't have one, that person could perhaps, uh, you know, win the case because they, they, they should not have had that information or their lawyers should not have had that information because there was not a, I guess, formal request to get that. Okay, so don't send extra information. Don't give entire files. Don't give entire statements. Um, you'd have to cross out every other transaction. Okay, and so this is how you cooperate and that is how you maintain your confidentiality at the same time. Okay, just honor their requests and ask for timelines. And again, like I say, um, it might have been your second signatory or a very close coworker. What do you do when the person who you go to lunch with every day or your ride home, Bria, what do you do when the police come to arrest them and you are the MLRO? How you get home today, Bria, if Kendrick are under arrest? Not Kendrick. Get <laughs> boss home, boy. Get. Ashley, what about you? How, how you get home today? They come to lock. They lock and Kendrick up. How you get home today, Ashley? What? How are we getting home? Yeah, how you get Kendrick is here right home. Oh no, I can find another. You go find another. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, Gerardo. No, but I, I want y'all to know this is very real because like I said, it's normally a close person or a friend. And not only that, you then have to give testimony against that friend. Okay? We had uh, somebody who was in charge of the Christmas club. The staff Christmas club account. It was like an, an ASU. And one person, um, she took $90,000 from the, the um, staff Christmas club account. But again, there were two signatories. Now, the second signatory had to say that, yes, she used to bring these transactions to me all the time and say that people had emergencies and that's why they was withdrawing throughout the year. They say to the sum of 90000 and only because she said, I did, you know, Ashley was innocent. I manipulated Ashley. Um, I, I, she didn't get any money. All the money came to me. I stole the money. And so, of course, she was fired. And then Ashley was, you know, suspended for two weeks and put on probation and stuff like that because Ashley was negligent. Okay, we, we had another um, issue where a staff member um, stole $180,000 from her husband's business account, right? And so they, he called Royal Bank and he said, put every dollar back on my account. And they said, but your wife stole it. He said, right, she stole it. You are supposed to check the signature and make sure that it's my signature. She's not on it. We have other accounts together. She's not on the account. They said, oh, she's been here for 30 years and she's gonna get fired. He said, she's gonna get fired anyway. You know, she can't keep her job after this, but I need my $180,000 back. And a lot of people is like, oh my God, he is cool. He's causing her to get fired. No, he didn't cause her. She caused her to get fired. And that he was self-employed and so, she was getting fired and he was self-employed and he would have lost his entire business along with her getting fired. So he was right to demand that we put his money back on his account. Right? Everybody thought it was cool. Okay? So even though you all have these work husbands and these work wives and these very good friends at um, work, you have to be careful. Okay, because a lot of persons, you don't know what they're dealing with at home and behemoths just as people off. i sorry to say. Okay, so you want to cooperate even though that's your friend. You have a code of conduct to follow. You want to, when the police comes in, you want to give. You cannot fail to disclose or you could also pick up a charge. 
okay? And we are the, the gatekeepers for these companies even, and to me, stealing is a disease, okay? So please do your best to cooperate. And again, like I said, whatever they um, send in a production order for, then you give them that particular item. If there's something else, like, for instance, we had filed an SDR on a person out of Russia. And in Russia, I didn't even know this, just out of the same situation, um, there's masculine and feminine terms. So even though it was father and daughter, the daughter's last name was CH and the father's name was SH. And again, there was no link in the system to tell me that these people were even related. But I, after the SDR came in, then we saw that there were a number of transfers between these two accounts. And I said, well, the only commonality is, is that they're Russian. And then I did some investigation and then I saw that that was actually father and daughter. So I had already find, uh, you know, sent in the SDR for the daughter and they had requested specific information. I couldn't just say, y'all wouldn't believe the Sadari, <laughs> right? So no, I then had to fill out another SDR on the father and then have them request, you know, send in a production order to request information on the father. Okay, so like I said, again, if it comes up in court, you wanna make sure that you do not breach the bank duty of confidentiality to the client as well as, um, you know, to the company. So, but you wanna cooperate and you wanna give them information that is requested or fill out the proper forms to ensure if you need to give them extra information, again, if it's used as evidence in court. Okay, and then again, when the police officers come in, remember again, there's a disclosure order that needs to be presented. You can't just say, oh, I give a testimony or a statement. Again, you have the duty of confidentiality, okay? So the law says, the FTRA trumps all these other confidentiality laws, but you still want to be careful because uh, in our courts, of course, you know, a lot of cases are one on technicalities. So you want to ensure that you don't help them with their technicalities. Okay, so the key, like I said, is to only give what is requested. You cannot give extra information. You don't want to seem as if you're hiding anything. And if you do need to give them extra information that they are not aware of, then you fill out the proper paperwork and you send it in. Now, like I said, the FIU has a case connect system where we looked at the form, the SDR form. Um, it's just a case of uploading this, the same information that you would fill out on the form is uploaded into the system. And then of course, you would freeze that account pending further instruction from them. Again, whilst you are waiting on those further instructions, you also cannot tip the customer off. So your organization has to come up with a terminology that you would tell the client, because of course the client is gonna come in and ask for the money or wanna make a withdrawal. So immediately once the FIU acknowledges receipt of your SPR, they tell you, they ask you, what is the balance? And if you say $10 million, then they say, okay, um, all withdrawals under 100,000 automatically allowed, just so you would not, you know, alert the customer. However, any withdrawal over 100,000, you please, this is your officer, and you call him first and you get approval. So that's normally how it works. And like I say, now that they've revamped, they've updated the law, they have a lot of staff on board now. They're very hands-on. And when you call, you do get an answer right away and they do answer you, you know, right away and tell you, okay, yes, you can send this wire or no, you can't. But again, we have to be very careful of tipping off. And so find out the terminology in your organization 
that you should use to um, tell the customer if they do, they come in to make a withdrawal. And it should not be that compliance, you can investigate or compliance. To me, when persons say compliance have the money or on hold or compliance want more information, that's a form of tipping off. Okay, that, that's an alert, something is wrong. Okay, so in, like I said, most of you, I had sent you to look in your terms and condition and find out what your terms and conditions say. Because most say that you can hold these funds for, for 30 days if you're in offshore. And I think it's three to five days if you're in retail. Um, it used to be on the back of Royal Bank's signature card. And so that was our first stance to the customer. If the customer came in, we would pull out the signature card and say, have you, did you read this where it says Royal Bank has the right to hold your, your money for three days? They say, no, we didn't read it. I said, but you signed that. And we are training all our account opening reps to show that to you so you know in the event that, you know, in normal circumstances, we you know, come in, you get a withdrawal right away. However, there will be some times when you may have to, you know, wait the three days. Do you agree or disagree? And that's where you have the opportunity to say, oh, no, I don't want this account anymore. Or some people say, well, I don't want this account, but I have to open this to get my pay. So I think, well, then you have to agree to the terms and conditions. So Kendrick, did any of us have a chance to, to look at our terms and, and conditions? Um. Honestly, I didn't get the opportunity to, but I can go look for it tomorrow. Trust me with that. Okay, so fine. Yeah, so fine. Oh, just so you would know that it, it whether it's thirty days or three days or, or or what's written there. Okay, and do you have a, a you don't, don't don't tell us the exact, but do you have a terminology that that you are using if you have to tell a customer or if you've never had that experience? Uh, personally, like that, I don't work on the front like that, right? Front line. Uh, but <laughs> I can't think of anything on the top of my head right now. But again, I don't work out front. Uh, but I'll find out. I'm going okay. to find out. And, and find out because a lot, of, like I said, a lot of institutions, they just say compliance, put it on hold. Or oh, I know it wrong, you know, but you should not be saying something, you know, alluding that something is wrong. What, uh, what about you, Ashley? Um, do you have special terminology or are y'all still saying compliance? Um, no, when I, I'm not on frontline now, I'm more in remittance right now, but when I was on frontline, I just used to ask the customer and say that we need um, a source of funds or anything. I don't specifically say compliance. I just say we would like, um, or I would ask if they have any, um, I guess sometimes you had, I had a customer before that cashed a check, like $10,000, and they came to cash. So I just asked, where was the source of funds from, and do they have a receipt? They said they just cashed a check, but I asked them to, to provide the receipt or something, like from RBC. I had instances like that, but nothing to say, throw it directly on compliance. Tip okay. them off. Okay, and are, well. you, are you aware of what systems? you're using and how the systems work to protect you each night in terms of like world check is world check scanning names every night is, yeah is i asked i asked our compliance officer that question i think last month and i had written it down let me see i think new accounts oh yeah new accounts they have automated system scans and new kits are like guess scanned every day um whereas Existing customers, I think it'd be weekly. But okay. new new kits are daily. And I think because sometimes they would notify you to say, okay, this is a new account. And it'll say up to 90 days new, up to 60 days new, or something like that. But I think when they pass a certain amount of days, then it would go down to weekly. Okay. And there is a report that spits out and tells you there's a hit against Ashley. Yeah, they, they scan against um, articles as well, as well as when you open up a new account, you have to Google search the person's name and attach it to the documents that you use when you um, open the account. Okay, so no, not word check, just Google search, that's? They do that initially and the, at the initial stage, but after that it goes into world check. Once it's uploaded, then they also do world check. 
Okay. And so in terms of um, transaction monitoring, so there are two types. You must check the names every night to make sure that they're not arrested. Mm -hmm. And then transaction. So do you have thresholds in your system that that say you verified this bullet for 2000 a month? She just deposited Yeah, well, when you open the account, do you ready? They initially put in your MDE. Um, and then once it's over that, it was it would pop up a notification to say this person has went over. I okay. think it's really whatever the monthly expected is. Okay, so your system is savvy enough to say, Ms. Bullet should deposit 10,000, Bria, 1,000, Kendrick, 6,000, like that? Uh, yeah. Uh, so they, they are blanketed amount. No, even for me, myself, I just arrived and I had to open up my account so that I can get my, um, my salary. And I had sold my car before I, um, before I came to Provo. And I had them wire me the money. So, you know, once they see that amount is way above my, what my monthly expected was, they immediately, I not, I can't say immediately, like maybe a couple of weeks later, they come to me and say, hey, do you have a significance or anything for this large um, wire transfer we see received for this amount? So they came to me a, a few weeks later after it was received. And so, you are staff, so that's staff, Exactly, exactly, <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, and, and you understood why, right? Oh yeah, I understood why, definitely. Okay, okay. I provided right. the bill of sales and everything and the title, I had a copy of that and the title um, to the car and that was sufficient, so. Okay, all right guys, so please stop fighting the banks, okay? <laughs> the banks have a statutory requirement to identify you and that's how you they generate your profile and they have a statutory requirement to monitor you, okay? So they are doing these checks and balances every month, okay? And so stop fighting the bank when they say, you know, bring in this document or declare the source of funds, okay? Because it, it's just the law, okay? And so co-op, do your best to cooperate and provide as much information as possible. In fact, when the deposit coming in or you know it's gonna be outside of your profile, send the information in just so they, they, they will have it right away so they don't even have to call you. Now, the thing about um, these transaction monitoring systems is that they are very, very expensive, okay? The system itself is expensive. Then you have to train staff on how to use it. And then it's an administrative cost each day to use the system. However, 90%, like I said, of the, in fact, 95% of the hits that you receive on a daily basis is, is a null and void hit. It's not your customer, okay? And so companies do not like to invest money or have somebody working full-time checking these hits. But when you have 800 clients, like I said, especially if you have clients out of Latin America, my God, everybody named Jose and the Silva and whatever. So you get hits all day and you actually have to go in and prove that this is not your customer. Because I can tell you the one time there's just one FTX customer that can shut down your whole business. Okay. And so you, you have to go to the, you know, the process and then you have to save your records. Okay. And you have to make sure that, um, it's correct. And I, I know I, I would have told you the story where, thank God, I FI was a part of the Eggman group because somebody, the silver, had gotten arrested. I got a hit. Again, I had the passport for our customer. However, the news, of course, did not print down in Panama that this, the silver's date of birth, you know, what his date of birth was. And so I tried to you know, do Google searches. I went into real check, there was no date of birth. And so, of course, I had to fill out an SDR and ask our FIU to go to the FIU in, in Panama. And again, like I say, because they are part of the Eggman group, they, you know, um, share information. And so the Eggman, um, the FIU in Panama then responded to our FIU in the Bahamas and then they sent me a letter back confirming that that indeed was not our customer and the date of birth of the person that they arrested was 
different from R. So again, I attached all of that to the transaction as to prove why we did not need to close this person's account. Because again, in our AML directives, it said, once you're accused, we must de-rescue and close out that account. Okay, so very important to understand the system your organization uses, how it works, and what it does. For persons who don't work in like these Fortune 500 banks, they don't have as savvy as a system. And there are some things that need to be done manually. If you are an account officer or in compliance, you must know what needs to be done manually and you must do it, okay? Because they are, everybody goes to jail now, okay? So if your company is infiltrated, and like I always say, the hackers and scanners are smarter than us, right? And so you can follow all the policy and procedure and they can still find a workaround. If you cannot explain, like Ashley just did, the names are being checked every day, the report comes out and gives us an alert on that day. You can see that no report, no name was printed on the report or on that day. Yes, Gerardo Taylor was on that and this is the investigation and here's our source document. Then you, you go to jail or you were charged with negligence. Okay, and this is why I always advocate for you to get your job description. If there is a function that you are carrying out and it's not on your job description, write it down, send an email to your supervisor and say, please, this function I do and it's not on my job description. When the authority is coming, I don't want y'all to say, Kendrick is doing it and, and, and Kendrick has no record. Okay, you wanna know that that's your responsibility and you wanna understand each task on your job description or you could end up in jail. Okay, I think the CFATF was in here in 2017 when they spoke on FACA and CRS. And this is when they confirmed that no longer is it only the compliance officer that's gonna go to jail. All of us can go to jail. All of us can be charged. And they, they spoke on the limited number of persons that had been charged. And in 2020, the FATF was coming into the FIU to help us with some of the cases that were backlogged. Okay, now the FIU have beefed up. They hire a lot of inspectors or analysts. Okay, and so once these persons are trained, people are gonna have to start, stop getting acquitted and actually go to jail because our numbers don't look right. And so in their minds, are we a law abiding country? Now, immediately after they left, the attorney general at the time had said they had prosecuted or brought 89 persons before the courts. I don't know if any of them in jail. I definitely know you no know, politician in jail. And then we making a mockery of ourselves by paying these people when they've been on a technicality. So who going to jail? Kendrick, Julika, Ashley, Priya, Eddie, Julia? Not me. Okay. Why not you, Julika? You tell me why not you. What would you could do to prevent yourself from going to jail? So I, I follow my procedures. So whatever our um, work procedures are, that's what I follow. I don't go without my uh, perimeters in terms of with my desk. What's not required of my desk, I don't complete. And I make sure I have appropriate uh, signatures on, on my documents. So okay. I'm not going to jail. So you're not the type to say, oh, that procedure too long, nobody will read that. No, uh, okay. I don't do that. I yeah. <laughs> All right. And you you were like somebody who I know done been in a position for two years and don't have a job description yet. They no, I have my job. It. No, I have my job description though. No. Okay. And make sure that yeah. And, and like I said, we don't we don't live and work in perfect, and I don't want y'all to, you know, beat yourselves up. Uh, you know if these things are not in place. 
However, I do want you all to send one message to your manager acknowledging that this is missing from my job description or I do not have a job description or the policy has a gap. The law says this, and I, I noticed that it's missing from our policy and it's applicable to my function and it has the risk. You at least need to have some, you know, indication that you reported it to your one up. Once you report it to your one up, leave it. Okay. Once you're breaking the law, leave it. Okay. It's their responsibility, it's HR's responsibility, but you at least need to know and explain. And what I've seen a lot in, you know, when I was doing audits was that most people couldn't explain. And that's why they got let go. And that's why um, the system was infiltrated. They, they couldn't even explain their job function. Okay. And part of my job was to sit on, I was in charge of the family and so I used to sit on the phone and call the people in Elutra and call the people in Anderson. Explain to me how you open an account. Explain to me the steps. They couldn't tell me. What policy are you following? They didn't know. Don't let me ask when last you've been to school or send me your resume. Again, like I say, when we ask that, we are trying to see if we have sufficient education and sufficient experience in a department. And if not, we need to, to, to move you around. Fortune 500 company finance department had so many issues. When we pulled the resumes, nobody had a CPA. No, not one, not one CPA. Okay, and then we have had other departments that had five CPAs and this, this, this was compliance. So you need a good mix. You need the, uh, the department to be balanced or, or you will still have issues. Okay, you don't need five CPAs. You don't need five lawyers. You need somebody who, who start from the bottom and, and come to the top, who understand how the institution works, who is operational. Okay, then one CPA, one lawyer, you know, have a good mix. But if you have all of the same thing, you still won't be successful. Okay, but you can't have a finance department with nobody with a CPA and I'm wondering why you have an issue in, in, in that department and people are using their judgment, okay? There are best practice, but when there is best practice for a function, you have to evaluate the risk and you need to document that best practice because everybody in, in the department should be using that one procedure, okay? So you all can't say there's a glitch in the system, so Ms. Bullet say, you have to add this one and this five and for the accounts to balance each day. Yeah, report should say we've sent this to IT. IT is unable to fix it in the interim. We use this or that. This is the process that we follow. And this is the date and time because you only remember six months from now why we was doing it that way. Okay, and that's the next thing with policy and procedure. Any document, any policy, any procedure, Kendrick, when you go to read, there should be an uh, index on the bottom of your, um, there should be an index on the bottom of your form that tells you which date this form was created. And any form that you see that says 2017 or before, it has to be updated because all the laws must change in 2018, okay? then there should be a, a retention date, okay? And an owner of that policy. Then there should be an expiry date. And just how you risk rate customers, you risk rate these policies, high, medium, or low. Okay? That's fair. Yeah, so check because with the confidentiality laws, I can tell you now I'm working with an account opening form that list the Bankers and Trusts Act of 1960-something. And the law had been changed. And it says, please confirm that you agree to section, I think it used to be 14. 
It ain't section 14 no more, it's section 77 now. And so that form should now be obsolete because the law is now updated. So we should have sent out updates and I keep telling persons, listen, even if you don't wanna go until, you know, you wanna use the form and tell, you know, each person is high, medium or low and the low people don't need a review for three years, any new customer coming in, stop letting them sign this old form. They are agreeing to a section that makes no sense. It no longer speaks to confidentiality. It speaks to something else. It moved from section 14 to 77. You all need to go read with section 14. Say. So that's another thing you want to make sure that the clauses or in your general terms and conditions still stand. Make sure that these documents ain't expired. And especially if you in the security is work, you you go to jail if you're using the W8 and the W9 that are expired. Okay, so make sure too that your job description is current each year. Or don't say this is my old job description and they never change it. Or this is the old policy and they never we don't do this no more. Just make note to send one email and keep a copy of your email, attach it to that policy. I advise my supervisor, so now the responsibility is this. But again, this is why you should be familiar with not only your work anti-money laundering policy, but the central bank, only if it's your regulator, the Securities Commission, the gaming board, or whomever. Okay? Because it, 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 it gets very real very soon. Some people got to go to jail. Make sure it ain't on us. You know, Miss Bullet, like they say, who's going to jail? Nobody does? Okay, four people. Four people. Oh, okay, okay. I know if any, you all have to see your money. Okay, so protect yourself. That's how you protect yourself. Yeah, that's how you protect yourself. Be able to explain. And almost 90% are the persons that I've interviewed. I'm sorry, they don't, can't explain what they do. They don't know what part. Oh, you mean that? They say, Mr. Bullet, you mean that big book? All we were supposed to be in that? Yeah. And so companies now, because you know, we are required to offer annual training and, and updates and tests and all of that. Companies now um, offer you like two hours per week for reading, okay? And so if your company, you know, everybody gets overworking, underpaid, that's a risk, okay? Because all of this to, to train, all of these and policy changes, especially you have to see, you know, where your institution is, uh, where we, um, people following policy and procedure, do we know it? No, then we have to now get these people into reading and keeping abreast and understanding the risks associated with their roles. Okay, so like I say, if we are infiltrated, then they can at least explain themselves and they don't get fired for negligence. Okay, because it ain't no more use the second signatory and you get no warning. No, you're going home to, or you could possibly go to jail. 90,000 of the staff money, you just let this woman sign out. And that's the whole purpose of having a second signatory. You know, so that, that second person got a slap on the wrist, but she was grossly negligent. Okay, so please protect yourselves and, and, and explain yourself, be able to explain yourself, be able to explain the methodology, where's the information coming from, research so you can make it make sense. You, you know how much times I sat down with um, persons with their job description, I said, read it to me. I said, put this that me in. And, and they, they didn't know. I said, but is that your signature? Okay, gone are those days. 
You can't do that no more. Read it, understand it, and make sure it stays current and make sure you stay current and, and, and make sure that you co cooperate. Okay? Because when the police take in these statements, I'm sure part of their process will be because that's part of compliance to say that this, this person is negligent. They, they can't even explain what they do. They can't explain what the controls are in place to protect the organization. They don't know what system, what the system does, and they don't know what they have to do manually. Okay, so I am saying this so you can take an inventory of yourself and that you can speak knowledgeably to what you do because a lot of people can't. And it may sound very remedial, but, it, but it's the truth. And, and this is why it's, it, it was so easy, like I say, to get a second signature for people to steal, to manipulate the system, to override it. You know, so, so the international regulators don't feel like they need to come on and help us. Let's, let's have process. Okay, and like I said, the only reason they didn't get to come was because of the pandemic. So I'm certain now that everything is settling down. You know, they, they, they will be back soon if these numbers don't get up. Okay, any, any questions or concerns? Gerardo, you know how to cooperate and still remain confidential? Ms. Bullet. Yes. Uh, question. I mean, I'm looking at that, right? And when you all say that you all met with him to see if he resigned, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, I got law enforcement up front. I got the people from FIU. Listen, y'all go in the back and get him. Bring him out. Uh, reputation at this particular point, because if he had break off running, excuse my English, we were, you would have been held liable. Yeah, but the, the human factor. He, he was upstairs. It wasn't, he, what is it, jump out the window? Well, as I've done that at PMH, trust me. <laughs> well, then. You know, we you you Kendrick, you never know when it's gonna be you. And I've had people being arrested too because they were the second signature. You know, and so I am glad that we did it because he got acquitted. And at that time, again, that was before two eighteen. I I I don't think Royal Bank had that if you were charged. So we 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 could have had a lawsuit against us. Okay. Okay. So, I, you, Kendrick, you don't know when it could be you. Julian, you had a question? Yes. Uh, you said to remain confidential, but know when to, how should I put it, report the issue? Right. And so you must report the issue right? But you still have a duty of confidentiality. And so what I'm saying is we have a habit of just the easiest thing to do is send the whole file and let the police pull out what they want to pull out. That, that's against the law. We should not be doing that. And so whatever specifics the police ask for or the FIU, that's what we give them. Okay? Because again, when they're in court, um, um, they're going to have to prove that they sent in the correct order to, to even attain this information. And I think Gerardo had asked at the beginning, would a recording be permissible in court? It was obtained illegally. So again, you know, there are a lot of technicalities in the system. So we just want to ensure that all your documentation that's going to be produced as evidence is attained legally. Ms. Bullard. Yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead, Gerardo. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I recall a matter um, some time ago with respect to Peter Nygaard, um, um, when there were two persons, some 
some Tugi or whatever the next fellow name. Apparently, they 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 too had a um, a meeting with him in a in a vehicle whereby one of those um, um, persons they had on a wire, and it was brought um, to the court's attention that um, a wire was you know illegally obtained, and the information that um, Mr. Nygaard at the time presented um, that was basically stricken from court record because it was it was. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know. It wasn't done legally, and that create that 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 created an issue um, with the with 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 his counsel, and um, you know, apparently, you know, he was acquitted. You know, so. Yeah, but again, like I say, technicality is Dorado. Yeah, possibly. I don't know if there's something in the law that states that, but I, I do remember that case. And like I said, Nygaard is another person who has had a criminal record dating back to 1970, before some of us were born. And the first time he ever hit jail was in 2000, 40 years later. So, yeah. I guess there is something in the law that says if it's a thing illegally, then you can't use it. I've only seen it on TV, but I, I, re, I remember his case. Yeah, Julian, you finish, go ahead with what you were saying. Yeah, specifically to that question, because I see it in, in one of the question pointers um, that's um, in our general guidelines for the whole course, right? Um, how would you suggest we answer that question? What you mean? How do you maintain confidentiality? Yeah, because I mean, if the order, if the order is not specific, right? Um, and you're saying that, are, are you saying that based upon what the FIU may request or the police may request, or another agency from a foreign jurisdiction may request of your institution? they would have general specifics? Yes, yes. You, we have a duty of confidentiality to our I clients. understand that part. I'm saying yeah. I've seen so, orders where the specifics that they're asking for are general and vague, though. Yes, but the, if you follow the law correctly and do not want this to be an illegal piece of evidence that's not permissible because you obtained it illegally, then you have to go to the paperwork of documenting that a, a new SDR and a lot of people just don't do that. Okay. That, that, that's my whole point. So okay. yes, All now right. you have to file a second SDR and, and, and alert them as to their, like I said, I had the Russian clients who at first I didn't even know was father and daughter. Oh, man, Miss Pullet, me and you supposed to then be set. You had Russian clients? <laughs> yeah. Oh. I didn't know. And see, the the, the males you was SH, the females you were seeing. The whole, the whole class was supposed to be sailing on some yachts right <laughs> Yeah, that was back in the day, Julian, back in the day, before the laws changed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so, therefore, you know, after further investigation, I realized that, hey, this father and daughter. And so, I couldn't just send the father's file. You know, the daughter was already being investigated. So I had to then fill out an XSP. And a lot of times, you know, we compliance too, overwork. We don't have time for this. And so you just don't send it. But no, I sent an XSP and, and then they, they um, provided a production order because a lot of times, in back to Gerardo's point, this evidence is not permissible because. And this evidence would prove to you that this person should be in jail, but because it was obtained illegally. So you just want to ensure that you follow the proper processes and, and, and you maintain that confidentiality on behalf of the bank, because the bank can be sued if they breach that. We are to cooperate. However, we still have a duty. So you have to strike a balance. Understood. Okay? Understood. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions or concerns? 
No, okay, so at the beginning of the class, for those who weren't there, I spoke about homework. And most persons can't, I, I don't, and nobody has passed this class without doing your homework. And so please look at the dates. There's one question left. Um, please ensure that you catch that one question and make sure you do not go into this exam without doing your homework. Again, the 5%, which saves many lives, is uh, you have until January 24th. So please um, ensure that you attend the civic organization and, and come back and share with the class so you can go comfortably into the final exam. And then next week, I'm going to send out a review sheet. Next week will be uh, chapter 10. Um, and so the following week, we will have a review class. So I will send out um, a review sheet with names attached and each person will um, have a topic to share with the class. Um, some persons may have two questions. So next week, if you do not have that review sheet, please let me know in class. Um, go ahead, Gerardo. Yeah, Ms. Bullitt, I'm just gonna ask my fellow uh, classmates um, if, they, uh, if they are going to be attending any of the uh, you know, um, social club players, if you could, um, you know, I'm just throwing it out there. If you could just, you know, um, give me a heads up, or I would like to attend. Okay, it's not too much to ask. Okay, great. So please, like I say, if if nobody invites you, then make sure you go online and, and um, seek one out, and and come back and share with us. Give us good information. So, like I say. It's you sit comfortably in the exam with 30 points and most people, you know, that takes away the nerves and helps you to think clearly. Right. I also oh, said. That sorry, Ms. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, if you remind, if you send a reminder um, Tuesday night, then I'll remember to ask about um, Oh gosh, Toastmasters to see if they are gonna resume this um, this month. Okay, so send it to a reminder tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Just to check um, Toastmasters. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you yeah, please, like I said, get together. It makes it easier, and remember to introduce yourself. The whole purpose is to network. Not just to go and, and listen with the network, get to know the movers and shakers, um, try to, you know, talk to like-minded persons, um, work on, like I say, there are three, four weekends, one weekend, um, you know, think about investing. Um, we looked at Arawak X earlier. Um, think about what you can do for the country, how to make it a better place, you know. Just get together and, and, and see how uh, we can work together to make this money. Um, it's time to write your vision. Make sure you write your vision for 2023. And um, each year when I write mine, I accomplish at least 75% of, of the things that I, I put on it. So, um, you know, life is tough, but if we reorganize ourselves, um, we can make it a little bit easier. Okay, so and this is a great group and so I hope that all of you are in the WhatsApp group and you all are sharing ideas and, and, and working together. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if there are no other questions. Happy New Year guys and I hope it continues to be prosperous and we'll see you next week. Okay, any other questions or concerns? All right, thank you, Ms. Bullock. Okay, and good job. Next week is chapter 10, so that means we would have made it. So we held on, and so- Good it, night, good night. It was quick. Good night, yeah. Eddie. Yeah, I'll leave you in. You know, yeah, boy. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah. No, no problem. No problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. So next week, final chapter, and- like I said, y'all, y'all can start to celebrate already because you did it. So mm. very um, good for holding on. I have a question. Um, I know, uh, Miss Mister 
or men's. Um, did we, hey, 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 what's up? Um, I was trying to find information for um, the sanctioned countries and how they did in COVID COVID nineteen relief. Did we? Did you all get to discuss that? No, I didn't bring that up. I um, I said I would have looked at. I know that China sent aid to Venezuela as mm -hmm. well as Cuba sent doctors to Italy, South Africa. And there's one other place. I have to look at and see what else I can find. The other place yeah. is called the Bahamas, brother. <laughs> well, oh, yes, oh, yes. The Bahamas, Kendrick. <laughs> but did we send what? We send, uh, you remember we sent stuff? We Ooh. sent on our Bahamas air flight to Dominica. We sent the Cuban doctors to on our Bahamas air flight to Dominica. And then the... Mm. Um, Iran had reached out to the UN to borrow money. The United States blocked it, and the UK lo loaned them 500,000 euros. UK lent them money? Yeah, UK loaned Iran 500,000 euros because they went to the UN and Trump blocked it and said, you know, that it's a whole part of being a member and they can't, you know, and so the, the UK loaned them 500,000 euros. Yeah. Okay, so that and you said and the Bahamas sent their doctors. I mean, no, sorry, these. Yeah, the Cuban doctors they took to Dominica, but in Bahamas. Dominica. Bahamas Do, yeah. Dominica is a sanctioned country, eh? No, Cuba is. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so they, we took the Cuban doctors. Oh, so we facilitated. Um, they sent some here as well, uh -huh. and then then we took some to yeah, we facilitated the air transport to get them there. Breaking our um, international sanctions, right? <laughs> well, we don't have Cuba sanctions. You know, no, we did. We didn't. We, huh? we don't. We don't have no, Cuba sanctions. But America have Cuba sanctions. But we are yeah, not America, yeah. Eddie. We're not America. <laughs> aren't we? Aren't we? Aren't we the the lab dogs? We it's are. It's, 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 huh? it's called in transit. Okay. <laughs> so there's yeah, no difference. We it's don't have Venezuela trans, um, sanction either. We have a very large Venezuelan book. Mm -hmm. Just like we had a very large Russian book. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So we, yeah. So we, okay. So we, we facilitated that because I was trying to find some stuff. No, no, we did not facilitate. If, right. if transit, if transit individuals come into the Bahamas in transit on a flight to catch another flight and they don't they don't land through our immigration process to stay in country but continue on in transit we are not facilitating okay <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, you're right. Oh, you are it. Get your terminology oh. together, Eddie. <laughs> okay, guys. Look at me. Oh, I said that going out. Sorry. Hello? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Ms. Bullard. Yes. Hey, you 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 said the, the final is on is the 29th or the 31st? The 31st. It's still it's still on that Tuesday. I understand. Okay, 31st. I got you. All right, because yeah. I have I have to allocate some time from work. Yes, please okay. allocate. Some time for study. Uh, block out your weekends from now. Tell your friends no. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't, especially if you don't have study time or now that Tuesday, please at least take a half day. It's going to be the end of the month. Government payday could be crazy. Um, please get some something to eat and, and be settled. I've had people sit in this exam for the three hours and give me a blind paper and just tell me that they were overwhelmed. Ms. Bullard, I had to fight the traffic. I had to pick my children up from school. I had to do this and that. Don't yeah. do none of that that day, please. Mm -hmm. None of that. All right. So today Relax we and unwind. Um, we finish off uh, SDRs and and ooh, SDRs and and cooperation with um enforcement authorities then. Right, right. And so okay. next week we'll talk about governance. Co yeah, governance and leadership. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Bella, just a reminder for you um, about facilitating the exam for me in church. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. I'll send Ms. Ian another reminder. Okay, thank you.
Okay, you're all right. Okay, it's so. done. Right. Okay, guys. So have a good evening and, and we'll see you again next week. Okay. Good night, okay. all. All right. Good night. Good evening.